Welcome to session one, the vital approach explained. In this session, Anna will explain how the vital approach evolved through experience from deep insight into the case taking process. Using this method leads to more precise prescribing without the pressure of having to take the patient somewhere. Instead, Anna shows how the ultimate target, finding the simulum, can be reached just by being with and following the patient. When we listen carefully, we can detect the vital on all levels. Okay, this is lesson one of the series of the advanced course and it is about levels. So Anna, can you tell me a bit more about your approach towards the levels in homeopathy? Sure. So my approach is a personal blend, of course, of my 25 years of study and, and, and teaching and clinical experience and attending seminars and everything together, my personal development. So that's why I call it my approach. It's a mixture of all these things. Um, I use a diagram with five levels, as you can see, and it's to uh, clarify and for pragmatic reasons, only five levels, what I see as a basic um, uh, theory, let's say, or philosophy uh, in my approach in case taking and also in analyzing a case. I call it the, um, the vital approach because in Hahnemann's organon, he's talking about a vital disturbance of the dynamics and to be in accordance with his let's say with our basic terminology, that's why I call it vital. So you know in the organon it is said that disturbance or disease is um, on this dynamis and it's expressed on mind and body by signs and symptoms. That my, that's my reading, my very short reading of the spirit of the organon. And my understanding is if a disturbance is expressed on mind and body, it must be beyond mind and body. So in that case, there must be a level beyond mind and body. And this is reflected in this five level diagram. So you can see there are like uh, circles, envelopes, concentric rings, you can say, like a Russian doll. And it's only, of course, it's a representation, it's a scheme, it's not really reality of two levels, which are physical and two le levels, which are, let's say, mind. And then you have the vital, which is beyond. So that's the basic construct. Mm -hmm. So how is this different from Sakran's uh, scheme of these levels? As you know, yeah, that's a very good question. As you know, I'm very much influenced uh, by Sankaran's teachings, among many others, but he was man, one of my major masters. And I think his um, level theory was a, a, a huge step forward in the development of homeopathy in the beginning of um, the, this millennium, <laughs> right, beginning of 2000, and he uses seven levels uh, of experience, whereas my scheme has five levels. So there are similarities and there are differences. I'll try to explain uh, shortly what are the main differences. The level one in Sankaran's scheme is um, the level of the name and his level two is level of the facts. He means, or the meaning is, um, the name of the disease, of course, yeah. of, the, of the phenomenon, one can say. It's not only limited to diseases. Um, for instance, we can say sinusitis. And then his level two is the level of the facts, uh, which means, um, I have sinusitis, mostly right-sided, uh, my hours of uh, aggravation are between 4 and 8, uh, uh, it's worse by stooping, you know, uh, what we call modalities. So this is individualized pathology, it's my sinusitis. Mm -hmm. And Sankaran says, rightly, that um, allopathic, mostly allopathic medicines are concerned with level 1, sinusitis. Yeah? And then you have other healing systems who are more individualized and they treat your sinusitis, my sinusitis, different sinusitis. So in my scheme, level one is actually 
individualized pathology already. So I don't make the difference. Uh, I don't divide it in two levels. According to me, there's only one level. It's individualized pathology because you cannot have anybody else's pathology. You only have your own pathology, right? Whereas my level two, as far as I can see, is lacking in Sankaran scheme. Level two in this scheme is called the energetic level and is the uh, energetic aspect of the physical body. So I consider it as a physical thing, but it's invisible. It's a more subtle, it's a more subtle body, the energy body than the physical one, who is tangible, measurable, and um, uh, the energetic or the etheric body, if you want, uh, isn't, or by special instruments. Uh, you know, killing photography uh, can make it visible. So this energy body or the energetic body is the um, uh, non-tangible aspect of the physical body. I want to stress this because it's not because it's invisible, it's something belonging to the mind. Um, it's responsible, in my understanding, for the vitality of the physical body, uh, the energy distribution, and it's reflected in the systems like a neurological system, a immune system, hormonal system, uh, the energy system, overall system. So we can have serious disturbances in the level two that are uh, maybe one of the most important um, causes of chronic diseases. Maybe, it's not sure, but it's very, uh, in my understanding, very well possible that it's the meaning of the Hahnemannian miasms. So the constitutional, physical, mainly physical, uh, inherited weaknesses of the, of the person. Mm -hmm. So this is my level two. There's a lot more to tell about this and we will go into detail uh, when we are discussing, analyzing a case. Level three, uh, as you see on the scheme, is the emotional level. On Sankaran scheme, it's the same. It's emotional level. I think that's one of the similarities of the system. Uh, his level four is delusional level. My level four is mental level and I um, consider it as a broader um, uh, level or a broader understanding of this level because the mental level uh, is divided in itself in three levels. We all know that this is, this is not homeopathy, this is simple psychology. So it's the conscious level, the level of our rational thinking and analyzing and understanding things. Then we have the subconscious level uh, which uh, contains all the uh, taboos all the experiences who were forbidden or too painful, mostly in childhood, food, so they are all uh, swept under the carpet and they're invisible in our daily life, but they're very uh, active. They are suppressed, uh, they are um, uh, unconscious, eh? they're not looked at, so they can only uh, express themselves in moments of uh, least control and this is very important for us to know in uh, case taking. So the illusion of the delusion level of the delusions in the mind are part of the unconscious but the mind or the mental level is a broader understanding, a broader concept and then we have the unconscious uh, mind and this is the part we have or this is the part of us that uh, belongs to humanity, to the collective mind, one could say, or the uh, unconscious collective, and it's mostly expressed by um, uh, symbolic dreams, that are a bit difficult to understand or to analyze, and we have to make contact with that level by myths, by allegories, by storytelling, fairy tales, because it's something bigger than our individual life. It's where we have part in the human experience. And then the fifth level, which I call the vital level, in Sankaran's scheme is called the sensation level. And although the name is different, the understanding is more or less the same. It is an experience beyond mind and body, felt in mind and body in the same way. And it is not a product of the mind. It is an experience in mind and body. In Sankaran scheme, we have 
a level six. Uh, he calls it the energy level or the source level or the level of the substance. And in their understanding, it's where the substance of which the homeopathic remedy is made is almost channeled. It's the language of the substance that the person is cha uh, channeling. Mm -hmm. and, or it's the level of, for instance, in a child, of pace, of movement, of um, uh, speed, whatever. And that's why there's a, an emphasis on the hand gestures eh, in the Sankara understanding. And I agree, there is a sixth level for sure, uh, where the vital sensation, or the sensation of the fifth level, is um, uh, expressed in every possible way, because there's, there's no way not to express your vital sensation. So you do this by making your signature. If you would make a drawing, if I would ask you to draw something, here is paint and you make a drawing, you would express your vital sensation. Mm -hmm. If I would ask you to make a dance or a movement, you would express your vital sensation. If I would ask you to make a sound, you would express your vital sensation. But how to prescribe mm -hmm. on all these expressions? Since the medium in homeopathy is language, Language is, you know, a set of symbols. We have to use our mind to communicate by these symbols. So, even when it's there, I think it's very hard to use it or to translate it into a remedy, which is our job, right? To translate the information we get into a remedy or to match a remedy to the pattern that is revealed before our eyes. So that's why I left the sixth level out. Not because I deny it's there, but because I think it's not very practical. Mm -hmm. So it's out of pragmatic reasons. And um, I do use the hand gestures and I, I do consider them as important and coming from deeper and more uncontrolled than the words, but they're part of the body language. So I don't make a separate level of it. Mm -hmm. So that's about similarities and differences. Yeah. <laughs> So you call the fifth level the vital level. Mm -hmm. So and it is expressed in mind and body. So yes. how um, how do you get there? How is it uh, brought about in the in the consultation? How do you find it? Okay, that's a very good question because you asked me how do you get there. Mm -hmm. So my message is you don't have to get there. You can see the expressions on all levels, but of course it's a technique. And I call it my approach because I want to uh, uh, teach how to uh, discern the information you get, whether it's vital or whether it's just belonging to the level of the, of the, person, of the person's explanation. Right? I will give you a few examples. So the advantage of my system, if I can call it, eh, my, the vital approach is that you don't have to question your patient until you get them on the fifth level. If you can, it's, it's fantastic, then you make a short prescription, but you, you won't be able in any case. And there are cases you, you won't be able to, to navigate, to help your patient to reach this fifth level of ex experience and tell you exactly the words you need to make a, uh, a short prescription. And I've seen this many times. Uh, during my teaching that then students were disappointed or they were they had a feeling of failure like I, I didn't make it and then they feel they have a worthless case because it's either the fifth level or it's nothing yeah and so my approach is to explain or I hope to demonstrate by by life cases that you can spot these uh, expressions of this vital disturbance on all levels if you know how and if you know how to differentiate so this is one of the important um, advantages. Yeah, it's pra practical, it's pragmatic, yeah? <laughs> and it's classic, even it's classical in my idea. It's a classical approach and it navigates you through the case. So if you see, if you can have a look on, at the levels again, how can you know on the physical level, for instance, whether you have just a simple physical symptom or it's an expression of the vital and it's the same question on every level mm -hmm. and this is important right because this is crucial a lot of people aren't, aren't able aren't willing or aren't even understanding what you're aiming at and they aren't able to 
to get to this phyto, this phyto level is very abstract. Nobody ever talks about my vital sensation. Mm -hmm. You talk about your expressions on, on, and disturbances on mental and emotional level and physical level. That's the, the symptoms, the complaints. You tell your homeopath, you, you don't tell my vital disturbances. So the patient doesn't know what are you asking. And you want to go beyond the mind. And then they get a bit puzzled, like, what are you looking for? And it's very important that the homeopath knows exactly what he's looking for. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And then he knows the, from what the patient's telling, he knows how to extract the information that is vital and to this differentiate with the non-vital. Okay, so what is this vital um, disturbance in the first place? It is the way the patient experiences himself and, and thus the world. He, he projects his own experience to the world, and it's it's a, a limited vision yeah? because in the world there's everything, and in himself or herself there's everything. But he has a fixed pattern, like a matrix, and or I have to use images, or it's like like a hole you're peeping through, and that's a limited view, a limited experience of all the possibilities, mm -hmm. and this limitation. You could say, even Vitulka has already said that, you know, health is freedom eh? and disease is limitation of freedom. Eh? This concept is not new. So this limited, this limitation gives, um, is the cause, is the source of all kind of disturbances, which are, as Hahnemann says, expressions, only expressions of the body disturbance. So I said, for instance, the physical. A patient tells you about his sinusitis. Eh? Um, to have the same, to use the same example. Of course, we listen to everything the patient has to tell. Mm -hmm. So he explains all about his sinusitis. If he doesn't know what to tell, then we ask. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see you suffer from sinusitis. Tell me a bit more about it. Very open questions, you know. And then we listen very carefully. Is what the patient telling you belonging to the pathology or not? If it belongs to the pathology, it's, it isn't vital, because then everybody with sinusitis will more or less have the same symptoms. It's common for sinusitis. What is common for sinusitis? You have a blocked nose, you have a pain in your, in your front or in your cheeks, eh? mostly stooping is worse, etc. We know that. We have to study pathology to know what is common in this particular pathology and what is not. And the funny thing is, in homeopathy, we only use what is not. <laughs> That's what we're doing. So we have to study a lot in order to know what not to use. So we listen to what doesn't belong to the pathology, because that's, that belongs to the patient, and homeopathy prescribes on the patient, not on the pathology. Again, this is very classical knowledge. And also, we ask the patient how the pathology is experienced, and that's a direct level uh, five question. Mm -hmm. And the way the pathology is experienced might give us a clue to the vital experience already. Of course, we're not sure if we only have information on one level. So we go, as the consultation evolves, we go through all levels mm -hmm. and we check all levels. But mostly the patient will, at some point in the analysis, jump from my pathology to me my life, my, my personality, my story, we know that. Eh? That's the emotional level. And then again we listen, emotional level, we call it story, but it means every anecdote, that uh, every uh, happening, every occurrence that the patient gives you as an example of how he feels. Hmm? So we listen to the whole story uh, and we don't prescribe on the story itself, but again on how the story is experienced. If the patient doesn't give it spontaneously, then we ask him. So we understand now, you know, you have a lot of problems on your job, in your job, and you have problems with your colleague, and she feels jealous, and you, you feel intimidated, etc., etc. Hmm? How is it for you to be in this situation? And then this is an experience of the story. Now. If this experience happens to point at the same remedy or in the same direction, the same group, then you know it must be from the vital. Mm -hmm. The same thing with um, the delusion, 
the patient can have more than one delusion. Hmm? Mm -hmm. Let's say he has a delusion everybody's watching. Hmm? So again, we can ask him, how is it for you to have this feeling that everybody is watching? Hmm? So the questions are always aimed at how is your experience on every particular level. By this, as I say, our stepping stones are the symptoms that the patient is giving us. Mostly, not always, but mostly, at the end of the interview, you have a coherent pattern. You have different symptoms, all belonging to one rubric, um, one remedy or one group of remedies. Or you have so much information that you can ask the, the final question to the fifth level. And how is it for you to have this and this and this problem? And sometimes they can say you literally, almost say, telling you the remedy. Mm -hmm. It doesn't seem easy though. <laughs> <laughs> it isn't. <laughs> to make this jump also. Mm -hmm. uh, finding the remedy then with a coherent pattern. It depends a little bit uh, if the remedy is known or not, mm -hmm. of course. And you know, we have so many remedies, and how many do we use, and with how many remedies are we familiar? You know, the more remedies you know, the more remedies you will recognize. But the advantage with this symptom, with this system is that you can prescribe remedies that you don't know. Mm -hmm. So your catalogue of remedies is much, much bigger. Eh? Even with a very, very good uh, memory, and with, of course, computer software, maybe you can use a few hundred remedies. 300, 400, 500 remedies is a lot. You know we have thousands of remedies. And with this approach you can even prescribe a remedy that is not even within these thousands. How? Because you know what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. So instead of trying to match the patient in a known box of remedies, you try to understand completely at the deepest level, the fifth level, of how it is to be the way the patient is. And then you know what you're looking for. You need the remedy with these qualities. The, another advantage of this vital approach is that you can um, group your remedies, that you can see group symptoms, and you know that, for instance, even if the remedy is unknown, I need a remedy from this particular kingdom or from this particular myosin. So you know what you're looking for. And then your search is, is more focused. Huh? So the vital sensation, is it the same as the essence of the tokas? Not quite, but um, the basic idea to prescribe on the essence actually is the same. The difference is in how this word, this essence, this concept is understood. Yeah? But I think, as far as I can see, that the tokas, and not only him, but maybe a whole lot of uh, master homeopaths, try to find the, the deepest of the person, the essence of the person, because that is written in the organon that we should prescribe on the most strange and peculiar, the most individual symptoms of the person. And this is uh, interpreted in the course of time in different ways. What is the deepest of the deepest? What is most typical? What is most individual? And so in the evolution, Piturkas was, um, as you know, the, the one who, the person who uh, was the, the reason of a renaissance of homeopathy with his essences. He understood our data, our classical data in a new way, in a modern way, and he was looking for the, in this bulk of data, you know, how, how many symptoms the, the polychrist had to the desperation of everybody, of every student. And he tried to find the essence in those remedies. And this was a big jump forward. But the difference is now that the understanding of what is the essence, the core of the person, what is the deepest of the deepest, has changed. So Vitulkas made the combination of um, emotional symptoms, personality traits, um, keynotes, physical characteristics, and he interpreted it in one remedy picture. And we know the pictures very well, we all study them. They were fun to, uh, to study, but it's like a personality. It's like uh, one possible expression. And this is the disadvantage of the system. So the, 
the first idea to grab the essence, the essence of a remedy is fine, but then when we limit our understanding to this one expression, and you know the expressions, the workaholic, the, the VP blonde, the washerwoman, and we know this typical uh, um, personalities, these, these almost caricatures of, of people, uh, limit our view. We won't recognize the same remedy expressed in a different way, and that's a disadvantage. So we would call it, now we would call it level three. It's mostly personality. So there was a time when we thought that uh, the core delusion was the most essential in, in what we were looking for. Yeah, indeed, that was the next step. <laughs> the, we, we were looking for something deeper, beyond the emotions. What is the reason for a person to feel this grief or this anger or this irritation or whatever, yeah, or the impatience, or all these personality traits that we see in Fitulka's um, remedy pictures. And so this was Sankran's idea, a very, very genial, genial idea, that there is a feeling behind the feeling. And there's an unconscious idea behind these feelings that gives rise to all these feelings. And these are the delusions, and even different delusions are all um, coming from one basic delusion. And he, he tried to understand again the essence of the person, but uh, um, uh, named as a core delusion. So we were looking for the core delusion. Again, the disadvantage of this system is that we disregarded the physical complaints altogether. When the patient came in, what we did was, was just impatiently listening to his physical complaints, waiting for it to pass, eh, and then start uh, questioning the patient to uh, something more juicy, more useful. And actually we didn't use the physical symptoms, or we hardly used any physical symptoms or any generalities or all our you know, basic homeopathic knowledge actually. And we prescribed almost exclusively on the mind and, and even only on this particular limited level of the mind, this unconscious part is delusion. So this was maybe a step forward, but again a limitation. And the idea was that this basic delusion produced not only symptoms on the mind, but as well sim on, symptoms on the body. And the, um, the vital approach um, doesn't agree with that idea that problems uh, come from the mind. The problems from the mind and the body, the disturbance from the mind and the body, have another source, the same source. They come from the same source and they are um, expressed in an encoded way, in a symbolic way, but it's the same thing. And this was unclear with the delusion, with the basic delusion uh, theory. Mm -hmm. So you think it's a limitation to prescribe either only on the mind or only on the physical? Oh yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so sometimes people will only give physical symptoms mm -hmm. or sometimes you have children where you cannot uh, find an, a more elaborate story. So how do yeah. you treat them? That's true. So some patients only talk about physical uh, complaints indeed. There are a few reasons for that. <laughs> um, sometimes the patient only has physical complaints. Yeah? And he's, as far as he knows, on his mental, emotional level, psychological level, he's fine. So he, he sees a homeopath because he wants to get rid of his physical complaints. And even if you try to push a little bit, he doesn't have to tell you much, or he's unconscious of it, or, or he doesn't want to tell you. Um, this can be for different reasons. Yeah. It's possible that the patient belongs to the Monera Kingdom, but I have to tell more about this later. Mm -hmm. A patient needing a remedy from the Monera Kingdom tend to experience himself on the vital level as either healthy or unhealthy. Mm -hmm. and he most likely will be unhealthy, otherwise he won't see you. Hmm? But this is his whole issue in life. And his experiences being normal and healthy or 
abnormal, not normal, because unhealthy. Mm -hmm. So the only thing he has to tell you is all possible details of his disease story. And it will be a long story with all details throughout his life. And it's only, we feel, only physical. But it isn't. Mm -hmm. It is the expression of the vital on the physical. And the expression in the mind even is healthy or unhealthy, normal or not more mm -hmm. normal. And how much you push, push or you try to push these persons to tell something more interesting or to tell something more deep, they will all, only give you physical symptoms. Mm -hmm. But that's a clear hint that you can make a vital prescription of a monorail. Mm -hmm. So that's one possibility. Mm -hmm. The other possibility can be that it's a very reserved and very close person that is not very much in contact with his feelings. That's another possibility. What we can do then? <laughs> Because everybody has all levels. Mm -hmm. It's not because somebody only talks about the physical level that he doesn't have a mind. Everybody has a mind. Mm -hmm. yeah. Not everybody has a disturbed mind, but everybody has an individuality. Mm -hmm. And this is expression expressed in the way he is, the way he functions, the way he feels himself. So, And this is his mind, whether he is aware or not aware, whether he is telling you or not telling you. Everybody has a mind. Mm -hmm. So, he will tell you, or he, won't, he doesn't want to tell you anything more than the physical symptoms. As I told you before, you will listen to, very careful, to what belongs to the pathology, what belongs to the patient. There will be something. If the patient only talks about pathology, this means the consultation is normally two hours. <laughs> In between the lines, most likely, the patient will give you uh, information on how he copes with his disease hmm? because he will tell you what treatments he already went through, um, what was the effect of the treatment, why he chosen this treatment, why not, etc. He will tell you how, how his history, his disease his history evolved. Mm -hmm. He will tell you about this um, impact of his disease mm -hmm. and if he doesn't tell you, you can ask uh, what is the impact of all these problems you're telling me now, your physical problems? And this will give his experience or his delusion, that is, his limitations or his effects. Um, in fact, it's not a problem to prescribe only on the physical level or only on the emotional level. You can prescribe on one level and this is your door and you enter this door, and this will lead you to the vital anyway, because every door leads to the vital. The only thing is, if you have confirmation on several levels, you're more sure. <laughs> we, we prefer to have confirmation on different levels, mm -hmm. but it's very much possible to just open this one door on level one or level two or level three, it doesn't make any difference, go in and question further and further, how in all details, mm -hmm. because in Every expression is the vital. Mm. And in children, and especially in children who don't talk, mm, we have another approach. Mm -hmm. We have to um, give m much more importance to our observation. Mm -hmm. And again, in my approach, this is a very important part of uh, the case taking. You have the information, this is what the patient is telling you. In the case of a small child, this will be a second-hand information, mm -hmm. what the patient, what the parents can tell you about the patient, how he looks, how he acts, what are his habits uh, of the baby, for instance. So this is second-hand, the baby can't tell you himself. And his, uh, his hours of uh, aggravation and amelioration, his food uh, preferences, all this the patient cannot tell you, but his parents can. Mm -hmm. So this is information, second part is observation, this is what you see. Mm -hmm. And in every case, what you see is important, what you observe. Observe is not only seeing, it's also um, it's smelling, it's hearing, it's what you, by your senses, mm -hmm. can, um, uh, can know about the person, can receive. And m the majority of all these uh, impulses, is implicit. So we, we um, absorb them without knowing. Mm -hmm. They make an impression on us and mostly 
we don't even verbalize this because if we would we would have rubrics mm -hmm. and we try to uh, train our students from the beginning to make this implicit information from their observation to make it explicit explicit is putting words on it what an impression does this patient make on you how does he look how does he behave how does he move uh, how does he evolve throughout consultation uh, what kind of impression does he make on you in his communication etc etc so this is what i call com context is mm -hmm. Content is the information, the context is how the information comes to you. Uh, the, the way the language is used, the, the rhythm of the patient, the intonation, his, his, his bodily, his uh, uh, face, uh, how it's changing, his voice, how his voice changing, etc. So in a baby or in a small child, this uh, context is even more important. This, how the baby looks, how the baby interacts, how the baby behaves, the impression the, the baby makes in the interaction with the parents and with you, whether it makes contact or not, yeah, will be of even more importance than in a, um, an adult case. And we tend to overlook this a little bit, the importance of this. And we have to translate it again into rubrics. And that's how you can prescribe or can make a vital prescription even with the, on the, with the baby, mm -hmm. on level five with the baby. And interestingly, very often, when it's a baby with, um, let's say, more or less severe pathology early in life, very often, not always, the baby will reflect the physical symptoms and the mother or the father will reflect the mind symptoms of the same remedy. Mm -hmm. So then you have information from both sides. Mm -hmm. Yes, I was just wondering where does the mind information come from? <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you don't always have it, but if you have it, it's by understanding. It's understanding what you see, mm -hmm. the behave, behavior of the baby, understanding the behavior of the baby, and the information, of course, of the parents. Mm -hmm. And you can ask the mother, how did you feel throughout the pregnancy? How is your overall feeling? How do you react to the baby, etc. Yes, I can imagine babies are a bit hard, but the, I think most difficult ones are the teenagers that mm -hmm. don't want to say anything. Yes, <laughs> this in-between group yeah, that are dragged to the homeopath mm -hmm. uh, by, the, by their parents or who want to come because they want to get rid of their pimples, but they don't want to tell you anything else, right? Mm -hmm. The acne is disturbing, but yeah. they don't want to open up because you're one of the adults. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> they don't want to share the secrets. Yeah, we have them and they're not the easiest group, but um, again, we let them tell everything they have to tell about their physical complaints, the things they want to tell you about, and everything that they think it's too personal, we don't touch, because I uh, emphasize the importance of spontaneous information, because everything you have to ask for could be a good answer to your question, but not something vital for the patient. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to know a little bit more about the, the, uh, the pupil, about his feelings or his ideas, then ask about somebody else. So instead of asking how do you feel or how do you think about this, then you can ask do you have good friends? Yeah, you have friends? Okay, tell me a little bit about your friend. Do you have brothers and sisters? And if they say, oh yeah, my brother, I'm always fighting with my brother, why? Mm -hmm. Oh, he's so annoying, why is he annoying? Mm -hmm. So it's all, always easier to talk about somebody else than to talk about yourself if you don't want to share mm -hmm. your innermost feeling. And unknowingly, they will give you an idea of their inner world by telling somebody else. So this is the information you can use and the physical complaints will hopefully make a coherent pattern. So you said something about the fifth level is important to distinguish or to define the kingdoms and miasms. How, how does that work? Again, that's a big topic and we are going to talk about uh, it in, in several separate lessons, but in general. I can uh, uh, give some information. One of the advantages of this approach, another one, is that you can 
um, determine uh, the kingdom and the myosin, as I told you, and already have some information of the remedy you're looking for, even if you don't know the remedy. Then you know, I need a remedy belonging to this group or this group. So this group or these categories, this group theory is new, it's very new. We only uh, have the first uh, hints, the first ideas, the first hypothesis of these groups no longer than 20 years ago. And, you know, we studied, um, Roger Morrison was one of the first, I think, who um, grouped remedies, uh, mainly the compound uh, uh, groups or the compound remedies, you know, and he um, uh, determined characteristics in, in these compounds from the part of it. So you have the K-like characteristics and you have the arsenic characteristics and the sulfur characteristics and the natriums and the magnesiums. This made our life just a little bit easier because we have so many K-lights and we have a lot of magnesiums and a lot of uh, natriums, etc. But this was only compound remedies and only the elements. But still, the idea was there that part of the remedy, the characteristic is made of of the group it belongs to, like the carbon, etc. So then I think the next one, or maybe simultaneously, doesn't matter, is Sankara and Scholten, who um, did more research and work on the periodic table, and who figured out that remedies, well-known remedies, classical homeopathic remedies with good proofings and a lot of symptoms, who are um, in, the, in, in the same vicinity, that they have common characteristics like palladium and, and platina and, and uh, argentum and aurum. So these um, uh, precious metals, they seem to have similar characteristics. And then the other metals, they compared and there were similar characteristics, etc. So this was an evolution in the understanding of, or in the hypothesis, like if there are remedies outside the homeopathy, that belong to the same group, can we, within homeopathy, classify them or see group characteristics? And the answer was yes. Hmm? We know that now, but this is it's new information. This uh, kingdom theory is a work in progress. It's not finished yet and we have to fine-tune a lot and add a lot of information and a lot of, for instance, plant kingdoms are not even studied or in the animal kingdom, you know, so vast we have to study a lot of remedies. But still, we can already work with it and we have the general features of the, of the kingdom in itself and the sub-kingdoms, which, which is so useful in consultation. So, this, uh, I, I said in my uh, scheme, in my uh, five approach level scheme, that it's only on level five one can determine kingdom and mice. Why? Because kingdom, again, is an experience or an experience of the patient leads to kingdom information. I try to clarify it shortly, briefly, because we go into detail, talk about it in the next sessions. But if you ask a patient, for instance, he tells you an anecdote, story, level three, and uh, of his of difficulties, of disturbances. For instance, he said that uh, he can tell you he's, uh, he feels uh, insecure. I have a lack of self-confidence, I don't dare to talk in public. And okay, so you tell, you ask him to tell more and explain in all detail and then you ask your five-level question. Uh, how is this for you to be always so embarrassed and, and to be timid and lacking self-confidence? And, and the patient will probably give you a few more or less general answers like, oh, it's annoying and it's limiting. and. Uh, Mm, and it, uh, it, uh, it keeps me from doing things and I wish that I didn't have it, etc. So, little by little we ask more, uh, yeah, and how is it for you to have it? And, and the patient then, if you help him a little bit, because he does know what you're asking, probably give you first a few delusions. Well, I think everybody can see that I'm a, I'm a failure or everybody can see my insecurity, etc. You know, everybody's watching me, for instance, in the example, and then you can still ask further, yeah, for you to have this idea that everybody's watching you and, and 
it's limiting you in your performance, how is it for you? And then the patient can say, well, you know, it's... And whatever he will say then, most likely, will lead to the ketone. Then he can say, well, you have nothing to hold on. You stand all alone and the ground is falling away under your feet. Then, you know, his base is, is not very firm and by the least stress is falling away. So this is a, a, an experience, uh, or you can say it's an illusion, from the mineral kingdom. Like he has nothing to stand on, nothing to hold on to, nothing firm to base his existence on. Whereas a plant could feel all this. It's very painful because you're, you're standing there and everybody can see your, sens your sensitivity and you have no defense and you know, you're so vulnerable. And, and then, you know, blood is a plant sensation. It's a, it's a feeling of a conifer. Mm. That you're breakable, that you're fragile, that you're vulnerable. And this could be a plant or leading to a plant prescription of the conifer family. And an animal uh, remedy or a remedy belonging to the animal kingdom could say that I'm like a fool, like I'm stupid, like I'm completely ridiculous, you know. Other people they in this situation they, they act normal, but me, you know, it's like I'm completely inferior. And then you know it's a matter of being superior, inferior, who is the best, who is better than the other one, and then you know we're in the competition of the animal kingdom. So this information already limits our search to a particular group. And imagine what a relief if you have a patient in front of you and you only have to look in the periodic table for a solution instead of in this vast ocean of possible remedies. So this is very, very useful information. And the Myerson's, or the Myerson's uh, theory is based on Sanguin's interpretation of the Myerson's. We go into that. In, in our uh, session about the Myasins. But again, it comes down to uh, a coping up mechanism of this particular problem that the patient perceives to have. And this is also a group. This limits our uh, possible remedies for this patient to a particular group, namely the group that copes, copes up in this particular way. So again, it is a limitation. So for instance, in my example of the conifers, if we have this particular family and we have this particular myosin, there are only a few possible remedies left. <laughs> and then we can even prescribe a remedy that is unknown to us, but happens to belong to this particular characteristics, this myosin, myosin crossed with this plant family. With the same result as if you would prescribe a very well-known and well-proven remedy with the same profound or vital reaction. So this concept of the vital sensation it seems very interesting to me, but still it's not completely clear to me. Can you just tell me again what you mean with this vital? Mm -hmm. It is a little bit of a vague concept, I agree. Because I said it's beyond mind and body, but what is beyond mind and body? And I said it's the most individual of the person, but it is not the individuality of the person, it's part of his individuality. And it is an experience, but how do you, how do you define an experience? It's a bodily experience, it's, it's a mind experience, and mostly it's implicit. As I told you, the patient does know what you're asking for because you, you're not aware of your vital sensation since it is the way you are. And you never question this. And you never ask yourself if somebody else has the same vital sensation or another one. So it's so natural to, to be like that that you never ask yourself, is there another way of being? You have to be a homeopath <laughs> to think about this. Things and to ask for these things. That's why a lot of people have a hard time to verbalize it. But as I told you, it is important that at least the homeopath knows what he's looking for. So, in my point of view, the vital sensation is the way you experience yourself. And if it's not disturbed, you don't, you're not aware of it. So, it's as if it's not there. You only feel your vital sensation when disturbed. 
in the same way that, for instance, let's say your stomach, yeah? when your stomach is disturbed, is, is, uh, you have a gastritis, then you will feel a physical discomfort and you will feel an influence on your energy level because you can't eat well, you can't digest, you feel bloated, you have pain, you feel drained of energy and you know, you feel listless, you don't have, you don't want to do things, you don't want to go anywhere, you don't want to socialize, you know, and then you are irritated because every, every um, noise or, or whatever um, um, uh, aggravates your situation, aggravates your pain, your pathology and you start to worry because you have to take medication and medication is bad for you and maybe you have an ulcer or maybe you have something worse and it's not recognized and you have a serious disease and you will never get rid of it, etc. So, on every level you are disturbed with this gastritis. Now, let's say you go to a homeopath, you go to a healer and your gastritis is cured. So you don't feel anything anymore on the physical level. You, are, you, are, are, you have your energy back. You don't have emotional complaints of irritation and you don't have worries but you still have a stomach your stomach is still there but you're not aware of it and in a healthy situation you don't have to be aware of your stomach it does its work its work in silence <laughs> in the dark <laughs> and without asking for attention and it's the same with the vital sensation when it's there and when it's not disturbed you are not disturbed by it on any level. So it doesn't produce symptoms. So it doesn't produce unwanted thoughts or it doesn't pro produce disturbing emotions or it doesn't take your energy away or it doesn't produce physical symptoms. But it's still there. It's your vital sensation, the way you feel yourself, you experience yourself. And when it's disturbed, then it's the vital disturbance. And that is what we try to, to heal, to harmonize with our um, similar remedy. The remedy has a resonance with this vital disturbance. So it is, as I told you, not a product of your mind and that's the main difference. It's not something you think, but your thoughts are influenced by the vital. The vital is first and you're born with it because the, the question is, is it the result, a question that is often, uh, comes up often, is um, if your vital disturbance is the result of some trauma in your life or something that happened and as far as I can see you're born with it you're born with it because it is so much um, intertwined with the way you are uh, and that's why you're not aware of it and it's so personal as your own face as your own facial features and it will never change so you're born with it of course you will evolve but evolve is natural that's not a disease or a disturbance but it is belongs to you, the way you are, in the, in the same way as um, you are born at this particular place and time and this will never change. Of course you will evolve but you will always have this date of birth, this place of birth. So that's of course you know your astrological um, quality of time eh, that you appear here and you have this particular set of parents and this will never change, whether they're dead or alive. You will always be the child of these two pa two persons, and so you will inherit uh, their, at least their physical uh, characteristics. So that is, you could say, your your, your bias and your physical mind, your constitution, your inherited constitution, and according to circumstances, this can uh, uh, give complaints or uh, or not. If the circumstances are um, very positive, then maybe it's only latent and not manifest, but your tendencies are there. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm trying to say. So if you have brothers and sisters, let's say you are the third child in a family of four, the rest of your life you will be the third child in a family of four, whether you are with your brothers and sisters or not, whether you see them, whether they're there for your life. You have your place in the family, so you're part in, of this family constellation. and uh, and. These things will never change, and as far as I can see, your vital sensation will never change. You're born with it, it's before your experiences, and it's um, determining how you will experience what is ha happen 
happening in your life later. So you will make interpretations uh, in accordance to your vital sensation and not the other way around. Mm -hmm. I see, thank you. <laughs> um, I noticed also on your schedule there is a mention of analysis. Will you talk about that a bit? More than a bit, but we'll do that in a, a separate lesson because analysis, of course, you know, is very important. I think every author of a homeopathy book starts to, with, with the words a good analysis is a half of the work or even more than half of the work. And what is a good analysis? Eh? We have um, recommendations in the Organon, which are very good, I use them. Eh? And the recommendations I give are, again, a combination of classical uh, uh, aphorisms and, uh, the, let's say, the blended with 25 years of clinical experience. And so I try to uh, make it in a little scheme that you have uh, as a help throughout consultation. That there are like steps, different steps, separate steps in a, a consultation. And it is a particular structure. It's not always like that. It's not um, inflexible. Of course, we, we follow the patient, know that we have to be flexible. But in general, there's a structure to our, to our analysis and it helps you to know where you are and where you're heading. So this step one, this step two and this step three that you can see on the screen, and I will go into it very shortly, is just a little help that um, I'm trying to explain to the students and homeopaths by your questioning what are you actually doing? It's as if you're the person who's questioning and at the same time there's somebody else uh, watching you or watching the anamnesis, the interaction between you and the progress of the consultation. So the first step is what I call defining the territory. What are we going to talk about? And this is exclusively determined by the patient. That's where we follow the patient. Then the second step is what I call more of the same. We question the patient about all the topics that he spontaneously came up with in the first part. And then the third uh, step is, uh, of the consultation is mostly confirmative. And if we don't have enough information, we ask more direct questions to level four and level five. And level four questions are fears and dreams and mostly they give direct hints to level 5. So there is a structure and I ex will explain this in all detail. Now that we have gained insight in the system of the vital approach, we hope that you are eager to practice what you've heard in this session. If you want to explore more, you can read Anna Varga's book, consult the schemes and manual or rather opus, or attend one of her seminars. You can find a schedule of our classes on her website. In the next sessions, we will see how the developments in homeopathy have helped recently even more with prescribing the similimum. We'll start with the classification in kingdoms and miasms. We will start with the classification of remedies in kingdoms and miasms in session two and hope you will be there.